Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Fabio Parasecoli. I'm director of Food Studies here at the New School. I'm very glad to welcome you to this uh, event in our series, Culinary Luminaries. Um, it's a series we started already a few years ago. We have two, three appointments every year, and we try to focus on innovators of American cuisine. Uh, before introducing Andy, let me tell you a few words about food studies here at the New School. Uh, we started officially in 2008, although Andy had been teaching classes uh, long before then. Um, we now have a large number of courses on history, culture, media, policy, environment, sustainability. All our courses are open to the public. So if you're interested in any topic and you want to know more, just leave our names. Uh, your names will be happy to send you information. Um, we also have a, a pretty uh, interesting series of events. Uh, the calendar for spring will come out soon. Again, if you're interested in more events, leave the, your name. We'll be happy to keep in touch. Last but not least, we have a website called the Inquisitive Eater, uh, inquisitiveeater.com, and we welcome contributions from anybody. So if you want to express yourself around food, uh, write, um, design pictures, photograph, we're very happy to have external contribution. Again, uh, it's inquisitiveeater.com. Now for tonight's panel, I will just introduce our moderator, uh, and he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Andy Smith has been teaching here at the New School for many years. Uh, he has an incredible number of books out, and the new upcoming one is New York, uh, a food biography. So I'll let Andy take on from here. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, with tonight's panel, first because Edna Lewis has always been a hero of mine uh, and one person who I've admired uh, for many years from afar. I did not have an opportunity to meet her except through her writing, uh, but um, I, all I can do is say uh, her story to me is an amazing one and I'm delighted that we can tell it tonight. We have five incredibly good panelists um, and um, there are some people in the audience who knew Edna Lewis. Do you want to raise your hand if you fall into that category? We would like to give you an opportunity at the end uh, of the panels to make a few comments, if you choose to, uh, about your experiences with her, and uh, we would uh, be delighted if that could happen. So um, we, we hope that um, there will be an open discussion at the end. We have, our, of our five panelists, you have been given a paragraph biography each of our panelists could have uh, numerous pages. Uh, they all have three-hour presentations that they would like to give. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, mean and nasty and told them they had to really cut their presentations down uh, so that we could have uh, questions and comments and discussion among our panelists. Uh, our first speaker will be Michael uh, Twitty. Michael is a culinary historian of African-American foodways. He comes to us. Michael, uh, I know that's in Maryland, but we're in Maryland. Rockville, Maryland. In Rockville, Maryland. Uh, and he came up here just for this presentation today. Our second uh, speaker is Judith Jones. I think some of you know Judith Jones. <laughs> I think she's, uh, she's been connected with every single uh, food writer um, in America during the last uh, 30 years. And she's only 21. So I, th I think that's a miracle for anybody to be able to do that. And we're delighted to have Judith uh, back. She uh, spends. Um, she lives on the Upper East Side, but she spends her summers in northern Vermont, uh, and she just happens to be working on a new book. She has uh, several books out already, and I won't give you the topic, but the title is Love Me, Feed Me, um, and we may or may not find out a little more about that as it goes on. Our second, uh, excuse me, our third speaker will be uh, Tanya Hopkins. She is a food storyteller uh, and drink researcher and uh, is a culinary historian here in New York. And she will be talking on the restaurants um, that uh, Edna Lewis worked in while she was here. Our fourth speaker is Chef Joe Randall. I want you to know uh, Chef Joe Randall drove up here uh, from Savannah, Georgia, all right? Uh, 
so uh, uh, I, I am absolutely delighted that uh, he could come this far just for this presentation, just to be with you here today. So uh, I'm delighted with that. Our final speaker is Tracy Ann Williams. Uh, she is a lecturer of literature and director of academic advising here at the New School. And um, we're absolutely delighted. She, she had to come across all the way from the building next door. So uh, that, that could be complicated at times. So um, all I can do is say thank you very much. And I want to thank our panelists, all of whom who Michael, who is Edna Lewis? Oh, Lord, in five minutes. Um, let's, let's start by like drawing um, a contextual picture. Because first things first, Edna Lewis was born at the very end of the African-American 19th century, the long 19th century. Because remember, in our history, all of those time periods shift about 20 years. You get about 20 years into the next century before you actually hit that century. So um, when you look at the text of A Taste of Country Cooking, for example, it's an autobiographical cookbook. Um, 1916, Freetown, Virginia, most black towns were not really considered towns. Um, not until they got a post office, and if they didn't like you, they could take away your post office, and you wouldn't be real anymore. But what made Freetown real was the fact that the people who lived there said it was. And it's that kind of independent spirit, that kind of self-reliance, the idea that there's this, there's this rural patriarch and everybody lives around them in this you know, compound circle of you know, related but sort of distant families and they're all going to the same churches and they're all helping each other harvest and they're all helping each other survive is really a very deep aspect that I think a lot of people who are from a southern background can understand. But anybody living in sort of a you know, pre-industrial rural economy can understand. Uh, the next point is, is that when it comes to who is Edna Lewis, I think we have to point this out from the very beginning. When every time you do African American biography, there's the me that people want everybody to know, and there's the me that I hold back because you ain't supposed to know. So let's get that straight. There's that, that boundary line that all of us make. It's part of our culture. Um, Edna Lewis was not from the Deep South. Um, Edna Lewis was from the Upper South. Um, being somebody who is a descendant of African Virginians, and that is a thing, because we weren't African Americans. We weren't citizens of the United States. But we were certainly very much a part of the land that we were, that we were born in. So the Virginia, the Northern Virginia Piedmont is this red clay um, not as deep as Georgia, but it's, not, it's getting there. Sort of reddish brown clay. It's where tobacco used to be king, but died out long before the Civil War was over, where corn and wheat were the majority crops. And um, it was the crossroads of Madison, Jefferson, and the like. So you see there are these influences going through. Uh, that half Virginian, half French cuisine um, that we talk about in association with Jefferson was all throughout the black community, and other folks will go into that. But the portrait that Edna Lewis paints for us, um, you know, I picked up this book and I decided two things. There was nobody like Edna Lewis. Second thing, there were a lot of Edna Lewises. They just didn't have the platform to write a book about their lives. My grandmother wasn't Edna Lewis. She was born in Prince Edward County, Virginia, which was very much tobacco, Virginia. Um, you know, maybe nowadays an hour and a half drive south. And some of the same conventions prevailed. Hog killing time is always in the dead of winter. There will always be spring greens, dandelion, poke salad, etc. There will always be cinnamon and possum time in the fall. And you have to know, you don't, you, know, you, you Yankee folk don't know about eating possum. You just don't do it any time of the year. And she doesn't shy away from telling us things that are kind of um, hard for the modern year. For example, when you're harvesting wheat and this go, this, the scythes are going through the field, and the, the, the reaper is going through the field and it catches a rabbit, and the rabbit's bleeding and half dead, what do you do? You eat it. You make it into dinner. Or when the creek flushes out the turtles, what do you do? You eat them. And it's this sort of background that we can even trace to uh, the folks in that part of Virginia, uh, since I do ethnicity, slave trade, and food. Um, 
these are Santa Gambian Igbo descended people. All those skills are filtering through the African experience, the African American experience, and this collision of African European Native American foodways that helps make um, Chef Lewis our honored ancestor who she was. And the fact of the matter is, long before we had these trend words about sustainability and local and organic, that was the everyday life of the black farmer and sharecropper and tenant farmer. No one had to tell us, don't, don't get food more than 30 miles from your house, because we'd never been 30 miles from our house. And I guess the last point I want to bring up about Edna Lewis's genesis is that um, she's also being born into the first great migration. Now remember, there's a trickle migration of self-emancipated people before the Civil War. And then there's the migration that happens between 1870 and 1920. Then there's the real one, 1915 to 1940. And that's the migration where you don't, you're just like any other immigrant. You don't, you have me, you might have one or two relatives living in the big city. You've never been to a city. I'll end on this note. One time I was reading A Taste of Country Cooking and I had to go from uh, Dinwiddie County, Virginia, where's the Red Petersburg, tobacco and cornfields, that's it. And it was so quiet. Enough, you know. And then within 12 hours, I was in Manhattan. And it freaked me out, and I didn't understand why. And I said, this is what it must have felt like. And then you realize, after all that noise sets in, that you now have this sense of freedom and ability to explore the world larger than it was. When I garden, I cook with Miss Edna. OK, I grow with Miss Edna. Because you look at that cookbook, and she tells you what to plant, how to preserve it, how to grow it. These are skills that we, we, we desperately admire and need. And there's this whole, this whole picture of what it was like to live that way, to be self-respecting, faithful, people of faith, African-American farmers, cooks, and community long before anybody told us that what we were doing was right. I just want you to know that Michael is a television star. He was on PBS last night. I thought, I'd, I thought I would mention that. Perhaps we can quiz him a little later about um, that experience, uh, which uh, to me was a wonderful one. So our, our second speaker is Judith Jones. Judith, he mentions a taste of country cooking. How, how did this come about? Well, it can be. You gotta get the mic close to you. It was one of those things that you can't quite explain in life when something just lands in your lap and you know it's the real thing and you'll fight to get it. And she landed in my lap. Uh, this was about the end of the 60s, I think. And Edna was, had quite arrived in New York. I mean, she, she had done a window for Lord and Taylor. She was the chef of a little uh, restaurant called Nicholson's and uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, writers and artists came to that restaurant. She was friends with Tr Truman Capote and, and uh, when she swept into my office, I should say that I got a call from the CEO of Random House uh, saying that would I meet with Edna Lewis and her collaborator because the, there was a book there and I might be interested in taking it. So they came to see me. And Edna swept in in this beautiful garb, something she'd made herself of, of an African batik skirt and uh, her hair piled up. And she was just such a presence that you, you, uh, you were almost a little awed by her. But we got to talking and uh, I asked a few questions and it started her telling some of the things that you were saying about how, how food was, hard work was a pleasure because the reward was, was good food. And so you, you loved the food and you respected it and you did it with care and you enjoyed it. It wasn't work, I mean, uh, and you, you felt all through this, the, uh, all through her writing, that she was giving thanks for something that seemed almost uh, precious. And anyway, we started talking. Now, the book that they had done was a little book for 
the restaurant and it had some southern recipes but it also had a lot of the kind of French rec restaurant recipes because she had to please everybody and it didn't have much character I mean there wasn't there wasn't a person there but when we started talking and she told about the, some of the joys of growing up and she she relived them as she talked I thought there's a book there and I said Edna that's the book we're going to write and so she went home and a week later she came back with the collaborator and I started to read it and I could have cried it wasn't it wasn't Edna and uh, it was sort of a touchy situation because I had to tell the CEO, CEOs, the designated writer that he had chosen that she had to go. But she was extremely sensitive, this collaborator, and she said, I know what you mean, I felt that that way, Edna should do it herself, and she left. And you don't find people like that very often. So uh, Edna and I started working, and she was at that time at the uh, the uh, Natural History Museum, taking children around. And she had, I think it was Thursdays off. And she came every Thursday for oh, over a year, I think. And she would talk, and I'd ask questions, and I told her to get a big yellow pad, and she just wrote and wrote and wrote. No stops for commas or periods or paragraphs. It just poured out of it. And it was good. Uh, I mean, really, uh, the, the, the work was only structuring slightly and getting an order to this book and asking good questions. <laughs> but uh, we, it, we decided that it should be based on the year and the, har the planting, the reaping, the harvest. And uh, we had, on my office floor had 12 piles of paper for each chapter. And uh, it was, was really fun to, to see a book take shape. I felt so much a part of it. And uh, at one point, I remember saying, hey, Edna, we're in November, Thanksgiving. We have a recipe for Thanksgiving. And she said very quietly, we didn't celebrate Thanksgiving. I said, oh? And she said, no, we, we celebrated, was it? What did she call it? Independent Emancipation Day. Emancipation Day. And uh, it was so wonderful. And then she described the dinner they had. So, that, that, but most of all, it was the beginning of a relationship with an extraordinary person. And uh, it came many, many nights to our house and we all made dinner together. And uh, she and my husband would uh, listen to Bessie Smith's songs and the little bourbon to go with it. And <laughs> just, just really a wonderful relationship, and it was true. The second book, again, she had a collaborator because she was really too busy to do. And there were some wonderful things in it, but it's not the same book. It's not Edna's voice. And this is something that, as an editor, I have felt passionately about that cookbooks shouldn't be just little jargon, you, you know, the, the, the typical place this in a bowl and beat it and first mix the first mixture with the second. And it should be you as the cook expressing how you, your pleasure, your discoveries, your creativeness, uh, and the joy. Uh, the joy or the pleasure is to me an extremely important part of that. And I think in some ways I learned that from, from Edna, that what a difference it made, who was behind it. And so we had many, many happy times, good eating and uh, lots of good bourbon, lots of creative exchange. And I think we really loved each other. It was, it was a wonderful relationship.
In addition to her cookbook, she was also a restaurateur, and Tanya Hopkins will talk about her restaurant work. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Got Is this on? You can. Get closer. Okay. So Edna arrives in New York City in around 1932 as a very young woman, uh, late teenager actually. She lives with her aunt and uncle in Harlem. And as Michael mentioned, um, the Great Migration, her aunt and uncle are also coming from the South. And so she lands in the context of the South has already come to the North a few decades before her. And I believe it's there where she identifies first uh, the quote about how the food doesn't taste the same. She's experiencing Southern food, Southern style food out of the South. And I believe her consciousness and, and her awareness starts to happen and build there in Harlem. It's also the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, there's a lot happening, but to fast forward, uh, through her and her husband are activists, they're politically involved. Um, he's a communist and that's important because it's through their interaction in the Communist Party, which is very diverse, that, and they cook for each other and they have meetings and um, after a while it's pretty clear that um, Miss Lewis, as, as she was known, is throwing down and people are wanting only her to, only to eat her food. And it's through this interaction, this diverse interaction and this um, bonding and connection through food um, and her amazing, extraordinary <laughs> cooking skills that um, Johnny Nicholson approaches her at, to, he says that he's going to open a restaurant. Now, I don't believe he has any restaurant experience prior to this, um, according to the research, but he um, uh, has a whole lot of other transferable experience and he enlists Edna to be his chef and partner in Cafe Nicholson. And um, for a whole combination of things, and this is well documented, and you can read about this because I'm not giving you my three-hour version of the presentation, which I would love to. Um, Cafe Nicholson is the place to be. The year is 1949, and as Judith mentioned, some of the um, anybody who's anybody, we're already in this era of the artist as celebrity. So the the writers and actors and Greta Garbo and, and Truman Capote, as you mentioned. I think Tennessee Williams walks her home after uh, one late night. Um, there's a funny story how, uh, I believe it's um, Truman Capote comes expecting biscuits at Cafe Nicholson and uh, Edna politely informs him that they, you know, we don't have biscuits uh, here. And I, I say that to say the food, the cuisine, the food, the fare at Cafe Nicholson is described many different ways. It's described as eclectic, it's described as French, it's, uh, some people say it's um, Southern French, French Southern, um, continental cuisine. There's no menu. It's a very um, innovative place for the time. Most of the write-ups about it talk about how different it is from any other place. It's extremely hard to get in there to eat, you might imagine, because of the, the who's who um, uh, who are there at the time. So through this interaction, um, it, it's, it's there where, I mean, she already her, was in different worlds, as Michael had mentioned, um, but it's 1949, and it is New York City, but there's still a de facto desegregation, and there is um, not a lot of that. It's very uncommon to have that type of, of um, exchange and, and friendships across uh, racial, um, cultural divides, which Edna transcends with, with elegance, grace, ease, all of that. Um, I want to backtrack for one second to also a point that Michael makes, um, that much of what we, we know about her, about the restaurant, about her, her story, um, when she comes to Harlem, uh, like the droves of, of, of black women before her, during her time and after her, uh, there's not much open to her in terms of work. There, it's very limited. So she is a domestic, a maid, a housekeeper. She is very good at what she does. She, she cooks also, but that's not all that she does. Um, and, you know, I bring that up because if not for this almost chance encounter of, of exchange of, of friends and timing and place, we may not ever know uh, about her amazing gifts and talents, which come to light in New York City and starts at, as we know it, um, you know, at Kathy Nicholson, where she becomes famous, famously known as a cook. Um, but it's not all easy riding from there. They, um, 
she's only there for five years, and um, that's a whole other story, which I, I won't go into. But um, she goes on to other adventures. They have a pheasant farm in New Jersey that uh, doesn't succeed. Um, there's some, a, a lot of other things, but to fast forward, they come back to Harlem, and then actually has her own restaurant in Harlem on 125th, which also there is not a lot written about that um, in, in doing the research. There are, there are different accounts. Some say it was open for about a year. Others say, um, or exactly one year. Others say two to three years. Uh, the name of the restaurant is, is not clear. Um, but anyway, that, you know, that is uh, also very interesting because um, she avoided the label of soul food. And at the time that she is opening this restaurant, it is um, somewhere around 1967, 68. And um, as, as a lot of people in the room probably know, that term doesn't come into play until that time frame, which many feel limits the food later and, and the type of food that Edna her, her philosophy and the type of food that she's doing is very different from what we now know soul food to be. Um, and uh, in terms of her, the authenticity of what she's representing and the, how soul food, um, many, you know, it, it's considered she goes on to be compromised in different ways because it's an urban, it, it manifests itself in urban context, which is not the same as living in a farm and having access to fresh ingredients. Um, fast forward to 1988-89, she is uh, asked to be the head executive chef at a very old and prestigious restaurant in Brooklyn uh, called Gage and Toner. Gage and Toner uh, has been open since 1879. I think it closed in 2004. And, um, her being there actually um, revitalizes the, the restaurant for the time period that she's there. I believe she's also there for about five uh, years. But it's interesting in looking at the menus over the century plus of uh, Gage and Tolner that um, there is a very palpable um, southern black cookery influence from the day that it opens, actually. and. Um, the wait staff, the, the service staff, is exclusively African American men for almost the entire time that the restaurant is open. They have things on the dish like um, they have, there's a fried chicken already on the dish, I believe um, said, and it changes that when she comes there. But it's fried um, with bacon, and there's a corn fritter side. And then there's also turtle soup, like a seasonal turtle soup that is um, on the menu. But she, she introduces gumbo and crab meat. Um, gumbo with a lot of fresh crab meat and okra, and also crab cakes and a few other of her specialties, but also does an amazing job at the classic preparations that are there. So um, I could, as you can imagine, could go on and on and on about the food and about her and her and the food. Um, I'm going to stop there and leave time for questions. I, I just had one quick follow-up question. You found uh, the um, archives for, for Cafe Nicholson here in New York? Yes. And where were they? They're at the Fales Library. At the Fales Library at New York University. At NYU. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chef Joe Randall, what's Edna Lewis's legacy? Well, uh, I have to give my personal experience about Edna Lewis to establish where I'm going with this thought of her having a legacy, which her legacy stands uh, as it is. Edna was a Southern cook, and she never allowed anybody to call her anything else. Um, she, she cooked Southern food that was homegrown. She cooked what she ate. She cooked what was in season. Uh, this trend that some young colleagues of mine who think they started inventing a, a year or two ago about farm to table is what she was all about 30 years ago. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, she understood. I, I've been cooking 50 years. One of the, my mentor's name was Robert W. He was from Atlanta. But the thing that I learned in the kitchen from him that I share with any person that wishes to become a chef is that you have to learn to respect the food, 
proper storage, proper handling, proper cooking. You have to learn to respect the equipment. And Edna understood that. I've seen Edna wipe out a pot for 20 minutes to make sure it was clean. And then go back and add some vinegar to a rag and wipe it out again. Because she just insisted that before she put any food in it, that pot had to be receptive to, to accept it. Um, but the, the, the part about her being a Southern cook is important because we have to realize uh, the young lady touched on it. Uh, Edna was a domestic. Now we must understand what that means. Prior to 1977, the U.S. Department of Labor classified all chefs in America as domestics. You were a professional if you came from Europe, but until 1977, if you were a cook, if you were a chef, if you were a butler, if you were a maid, if you were a housekeeper, you were just a domestic. And so a couple things happened after 1977 that I could go on for hours about. But as far as Edna is concerned, she knew who she was. It, during the time when she was at Cafe Nicholson, she didn't give herself the title chef. People bestowed that on her. And she was resistant to it because she was just a Southern cook and who enjoyed cooking Southern food. Now, she was a chef. Don't let me misquote myself. She taught herself. She uh, observed and was knowledgeable about the kitchen. Uh, when she left New York, she went south to Chapel Hill. She worked in Chapel Hill for a few years. She worked in, in Charleston at a place called Middleton Place. They still have her chocolate flute souffle on the menu today. And she'd been gone 20 years. What was the address on that again? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she crab soup. If you mention Charleston and she crab soup, somebody gonna call Edna Lewis's name. But uh, that was a, a real important part for me. She did go from, you know, I've been cooking 50 years, as I said, and I remember when there were like 500 culinary schools or cooking schools in the country. Now there might be 50,000. And there used to be cook training programs. And you went to school, learned to be a cook, and then you worked under a good chef to learn how to be a chef. They start charging so much money, they want the title chef when they graduate. But they have no experience. Can you imagine a doctor being a doctor before he does his internship? You know, it just doesn't make sense. You got to get out and work under somebody who's good so you can become good. And Edna worked around people who appreciated good food and that helped to make her greater. And so Chef Edna Lewis um, carried herself with grace and dignity. Quick story and then I'm gonna finish up. In 1994, a dear friend of mine, a New Yorker, named Patrick Clark. Some of you may know his name. Mm -hmm. Patrick had left New York. After he closed Metro, he went to work for BJ. And uh, he was in Beverly Hills. And so I, he and I got close. I had wife and children. He had children. We, we just cooked at each other's houses on holidays and brought everybody. But he came back to D.C. to the Hay Adams. And I had talked him into hosting a dinner for the Taste of Heritage Foundation. And Edna was one of the cooks that did a dish. Uh, several other young chefs that I'd worked with over the years. But we were there just in awe of Edna in the kitchen. And this is 8 o'clock in the morning. And we said, darling, you're making black bear cobbler. We know you can handle that. Why don't you go lay down and put your feet up and relax and we'll come get you. She said, I'm not going nowhere. I don't want to miss nothing. And she stayed there from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock that night, all day. And it was the best black bear cobbler I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> but uh, that's the kind of person she was. She was so gracious to each and every one of us. Uh, unfortunately, in some senses, she wasn't as familiar 
or the black community wasn't as familiar with her as other communities uh, until more recent years. But she in her heart always would speak of those folks that she encountered on trains, Pullman car porters, those black cooks that worked on the railroad, uh, in the country clubs, um, on, on ships. So she knew, uh, especially when she was around the South, because her becoming a cook and then going on to a restaurant was just a progression. If you ever get to Atlanta, it's a place called Mary Max. And if you go to Mary Max, they have wonderful Southern food. I mean, you can get a little cup of pot liquor, a little cornbread to dip in it. And But that restaurant was started because the lady saw some legislators looking for a place to eat, found a building, went home, got two of her friends, they took their cooks and went down and opened up the restaurant. And so it, 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 it was just a progression. Anyway, I was in Jacksonville, Florida at a minority chef's stomach. And I heard chefs, young African-American chefs who had gone to culinary schools, graduated from the CIA and Johnson Wales and other schools. And they were just kind of frustrated. I said, well, what's the problem? And you know, unfortunately, I love Marcus. He's a dear friend of mine, but some people in the world think he's the only black cook in the world, because that's all they see. And so we, decided, uh, a few of us, that we wanted to do something to give a voice for African Americans in food service. We've been cooking 400 years, and it was something that was relegated to us. It wasn't something we chose, but we turned out to be pretty good at it. If you remember Madison Avenue in 1935-36, Uncle Ben was on the cover of the rice box, and your mama was on the pancake box. Uncle Remus was on the surf box. So African Americans had a prominent position as being the authority in food in America. But that 77 changed everything because it became a profession. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, it was everybody has wanted their son or daughter to be the next one on Top Chef. You know, and that's unfortunately what we think. We go to school, get on TV, get rich, and then don't do nothing for the rest of our life. But food service is hard work, and Edna wasn't afraid to work hard. And that's what made her a wonderful chef. The foundation has a mission. It is to honor, cultivate, and preserve the rich African-American culinary history by offering a variety of events. We do a program on her birthday every year in Atlanta. I have a culinary, I'm a cooking school in Savannah that I've had for 13 years, which she inspired me to open. When she went to Atlanta, her goal was to open a cooking school there, and it just never materialized, but that's what she wanted. She wanted to open a cooking school and teach authentic Southern recipes, because her philosophy was if we don't teach people how to cook them, it'll get lost. Because we have young chefs today, and the first thing you hear out their mouth is, this is new Southern cooking. Mm -hmm. And to me, that means they don't know nothing about the old. <laughs> but uh, that was uh, one of the founding things. So we, we will have some educational events. We hope to honor some of those young chefs that are making strides in the industry. And, and doing that in Edna's name, I think, just makes it that much more of a wonderful thing. Uh, we we just happen to have a brochure for the foundation. Has it been handed out? Can we hand it out? Uh, and uh, can, you, can you hand it out to people? And I, I just want you to know that um, uh, Chef Joe Randall brought up copies, hardback copies of the Taste of Country Cooking. Anybody doesn't have one, we make sure you get one tonight. J just for a small contribution of $25 to the foundation. I personally have made a contribution to the foundation, and those of you that have money, not my students, uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, make a contribution in some fashion as well. Yeah, and we and also... Joe, and, and Chef, you're going to be doing a fundraiser here in New York City yes, sometime. Yes, we're working on that now, and we'll, we'll, I'll make sure that you will get the information. We don't have it concrete yet. I'll be there. All okay. Right. Also, we have a, a documentary that was done by a gentleman from Virginia uh, who interviewed Edna back in the 80s. 
and he had all this uh, recordings of, of her in her natural voice talking about how she grew up, where she grew up, how the food was. And so he put this documentary about a year ago together and then donated it to the foundation. So we have some of those available if you want. The books are 25 and the documentary is 13. And that's all contributions to the Edna to, Lewis to, Foundation. To the Jeff will be over there selling it after the end of the presentation. Right. Leanne. Not Leanne, but oh. Tracy Ann. But I, I, can't, I can be Leanne. Tracy Ann, my no. mind is um, flowing Please. off onto the um, chocolate mousse. So No, uh, no, no, no. It's absolutely. You're Leanne? I love it. So I'm going to have Leanne come up and speak, um, perhaps like me or uh, in her own voice. So what I'm going to do is bookend um, some of the comments that were already made because I'm sure that you're eager to begin the conversation and to talk, but I wanted to underscore just a few things um, and to make a few points that I think are necessary um, about African-American women in the early part of the 20th century. African-American women, um, as Michael said already, um, were coming to the North to flee in some, in some instances some of the, the Jim Crow segregation and violence that was occurring in the segregated South. In Miss Lewis's case, her father had passed away. Um, and not uncommon for a teenage girl in this time period to leave home in search of other opportunity. This is an American sensibility. It's a Huck Finn kind of sensibility, although some of you may be like, why am I mentioning Huck Finn? in relationship to Edna Lewis. This is an American sensibility to strike out, to light out on your own, to quote the text, and to recreate the self. And so, as many women did in this time period, you received um, your status or your station in life from your primary male family member. Her father had passed on, so now it's her responsibility to make her way in the world, and that is essentially what she did. She arrives in New York, between two major military incursions across the ocean. And this is both um, an opportunity, but it's also a difficult time period, not just for women, but for African American women. So indeed, she did arrive in the city at a time when the, 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 the series of occupations that were available to women were in the realm of the domestic areas. I think we need to be careful though, um, in case anybody would go there, and I, I know that you're a smart audience so you wouldn't. Um, domestic work is very necessary work, um, and so women and men, but primarily women and primarily African American women were performing this labor and doing it at a high level of expertise. And yes, through a series of coincidences, opportunities, um, she was able to create a different space or a different narrative for herself, which leads me to her cookbook. Um, it's striking that it's called a cookbook because it's a cookbook because it has recipes, um, of course, but it's also a memoir. It's a history. It's a cultural history. It's a document of rural life. So in that sense, it's kind of a cultural autobiography rather than just simply what you would think of as, as Judith said, mix here, stir here, teaspoon of this, teaspoon of that. And in that sense, I would situate her within a 19th century African-American literary tradition in which women are creating a space for themselves to write because one, women were not supposed to write Two, African Americans were supposed to write, and dear God, three, African American women are not supposed to write. So in that sense, she is a revolutionary, she's a visionary, because, and it's coming, it, and that comes actually out of her own history, having come from a place like Freetown, a place that, um, despite odds, and there were a number of these towns in the United States, many of them no longer in existence um, due to the, uh, let's just say, interventions of other members of uh, the United States. But coming from a place like Freetown, she would have been imbued 
with a political sense and a, and a strong sense of self. So it doesn't surprise me that she would seek to document her life in this way. Because again, I think that it's, I don't want to say that it's not a cookbook, but I think that it's somewhat reductive to call it a cookbook because it's so many other things at the same time. That's what makes it unique. That's what makes it distinctly African-American. And that's what makes it a distinctly African-American female text. I'll stop there. I have a dozen questions, but I really want to get to the audience. If you have questions, or hopefully those of you who have comments who knew Edna Lewis, I would hope very much that you could go up to the microphone, uh, or the microphone will be brought to you. So um, can we have those, those who knew Edna Lewis or met her, can you please start off? Okay. Um, give I, your name, because this is recorded, so can you give Susan your name? Dresner. And I met her when I was first starting to cater. And I think we met in the farmer's market. I'm not sure where we met. But we immediately were attracted to each other the way we picked out fruits and vegetables. And we talked about um, cooking and the respect for food. I mean, that was elementary. And she, later on, when she got to Gaging Tolner, invited me there, and like it was her kitchen. Um, and what I remember most about her is how elegant, what an elegant woman this was, and, and, and also a woman who was earthy. That, that combination, and she was just wonderful. Thank you. Next. Molly, do you, have, you, you want to make some comments? Thank you. Molly O'Neill. Can I ask a question? Oh. Um, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, did you want me to say anything in particular? No. <laughs> you knew her. I, went. I did. Um, I met Miss Lewis shortly after I moved to New York in 1982 and, um, and got to know her very well when Peter Ashkenazi took over the, the lease at Gage and Tolner. And, and his complete motivation for doing that was to create a platform for Miss Lewis. He would not have signed the lease had Miss Lewis not been part of it. And um, I had some wonderful, wonderful times with her and Peter um, going to the Fulton Fish Market and choosing the fish. And, and that intense work ethic was, was really amazing. But so was her natural elegance. Um, one of the things that I um, missed in a recent, um, a recent film that was shown at the Southern Foodways Alliance was this rush to pigeonhole Miss Lewis as an African-American chef, and she will just be an African-American chef, and she will be a Southern chef, and she... Miss Lewis was, was an African-American chef. Miss Lewis was from the South, but she was an extraordinarily elegant human being. And this bold, bohemian spirit, who, as, as Judith said, commanded a room when she, when she walked in, commanded the Fulton Fish Market when she walked through there. I mean, there was no place I went with her in which people didn't stand back because this presence had come among them. And there was a, a kind of dignity from her that I, I always dream that I'll someday be able to have. Um, it, it was immense. The greatest shock of my relationship with Edna Lewis was after years and years and years of the, the family farm. The family farm, we're going, to, we're going to the family farm. We're going to Freetown, we're going to the farm, to the farm, to the farm. And Peter and I flew on separate planes to get to the family farm. But we met in the airport and drove to the family farm. And the family farm was a track house. And the family farm had a, a little backyard and kind of a side yard and Freetown wasn't a town per se. It was like many of the things in where I have a house in upstate New York. Once it was a town, maybe a hundred years ago it was a town and what's left is a narrow backbone of houses 
that may have started as shanties and then had rooms built onto them and then had a new facade put on and then and then and then and then it was a garden and and about a five room house but in miss lewis's mind it was the farm it was the family it was where dinner came from and it was a we had gone for a homecoming weekend so that all the family members were coming home and we were honored to be, you know, part of that weekend. And the cooking that went on in this one room that was, you know, a kitchen and a living room and a preserving kitchen and had a dry sink that had been turned into a wet sink was unbelievable. Um, you know, 200 people were co cooked for, for, you know, I think it was two or three days of just constant meat. The meals never stopped. But it didn't appear that anybody ever broke a sweat or that any foot ever touched the ground. Up here. I just wanted to comment um, to the first question or the first comment um, about meeting her in the market. And um, when she goes to work, in, to work at Gage and Tolner, uh, in 89 and she declares up front that she's going to retire when she turns 75 and I think she um, achieves that goal. She may have stayed an extra year beyond that. But she never lives in Brooklyn and so she commutes back and forth from Manhattan to Brooklyn every single day. This just speaks, you know, to build on what Molly's saying about her work ethic and her commitment. And there, there are no farmers markets in Brooklyn the way they are today. So she's shopping for at Gage and Tolner at uh, the Union Square Market right here, and um, and commuting back and forth, and just and just committed and, and shopping at the Fulton Market wherever that was, which was not where the the Green Market was. So I just wanted to add to that in terms of um, her work wasn't just you know in the kitchen; it was running around New York, which we all know is not easy. <laughs> and when she was in those markets, her presence was felt. You'd walk through, and don't so many people would say. Hello, Miss Lewis. Tried your egg something or other, and and she just beamed. And she loved it, and and also she gave very frank advice to people who asked it whether that's what made a good peach. Yeah. She'd walk fifty blocks for a peach. <laughs> Stand up. Um, can you hear me on there? My name is Nina Williams and Bang, and I'm actually Edna's niece, and I remember. And you're coming I'm the from. Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. Aurora, Colorado, mm. yes. <laughs> um, I'm just thrilled to be here. And on behalf of the Lewis family, I just thank all of you, and I thank all of you, and she would just be so intensely proud. I actually was the one that typed up the manuscript for her book starting when I was 12 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember all of those yellow legal pads, and we used to joke about, um, Aunt Edna's is what I call her, um, her, her chicken scratch handwriting, which I would try and read and interpret and type up. And I remember to this day, many of the words in the book, the sweet-faced baby calf. Um, and and I just, I'm just filled up with so emotion, so much emotion. Um, Edna was, as you're saying, just elegant and graceful. And for me, funny. She was my mother's older sister. She, um, their father had died, and she brought my mom from the South and raised her, put her through high school in New York City. She put her into Julia Richmond High School and enrolled her in the Art Students League back in 1940-something. And they lived together down on 54th Street um, you know, for years and years. And I assume while she was cooking at Cafe Nicholson. Mm -hmm. And I was born, we moved up to the Bronx. Uh, when my mother got sick in 1970, Aunt Edna and her husband moved out of their apartment in Harlem and moved into our apartment in the Bronx. So I would you know, have someone to stay with because my mom went in the hospital in Philadelphia and the other sister took care of her. Um, she came from a long line of really powerful, very strong Southern women, starting with their mom, the grandmother that she learned how to cook from. And I just kind of recently realized, even though it's in the book, that Aunt Edna learned how to cook from someone who'd been a slave. And she in turn raised me, my mom and me. So here I am, 2013, I was raised by somebody who was raised by a slave. I think that's incredible. Um, so she, she passed that cooking on and um, I just think that the, just the incredible memory that she had to uh, remember and record all of the lifestyle and the food and the way of living 
in her book is so powerful and there must be lessons for us today that this community can come out of slavery and build a town and build, grow orchards and food and food that is remembered and has led to a movement around the country and around the world of this fresh food um, is just something that I think is incredible. She has a sibling. Our family is still in Virginia. Freetown is um, no longer, I think there was a last chimney that fell down in the last earthquake last summer or summer before last. So folks are not living there, although there are some folks who've got some land on the edge. But our family lives up the road. And she has a sister who's almost 90, who's still driving. She's still raising chickens and turkeys, cooking the same way. She's still growing food. So this is all still living. I mean, there's not necessarily hog killing and harvesting in this way. But a lot of folks are still eating that food and trying to eat that freshly. I try and do a little gardening myself. <laughs> That, that's right, growing yeah, quail. I, aunt, my Aunt Ruth, I talk every day on the phone. She's still raising quail from the egg all the way through. She um, slaughters the animals herself and cooks them as well. Uh, so, yes, that's right, and quite, quite in style. <laughs> so um, we're just thrilled that you all are remembering all this um, and that people are still being inspired. She started, I mean, the book, she was in her 50s. Is that mm -hmm. right, Judith? 50s no, or 60s? No. So 75 and 80. She was cooking starting at 7 a.m. till 11 at night, and she just ran rings around everybody else in the kitchen, totally. Um, and just her, her cooking and her sensibility, her pride, her African heritage, her pride in her ancestry, the folks who came through Freetown, what they went through, how they struggled, um, was just incredible and still continue to be such an inspiration. And I'm glad that you all are talking about the fact that she was domestic help and, and all of these women were. And in spite of that, they created a cuisine that we still admire and can learn from today. So thank you. Thanks to Nina, I was also able to talk to Aunt Ruth. And um, yeah. Other uh, comments or questions? My, my name is Linda Anderson. Can you, can you stand up? Okay. My name is Linda Anderson, and I'm a friend of Nina's for many years. And I met Aunt Edna through Nina. And I met Aunt Edna through Nina. I call her Aunt Edna because I felt as if she was my aunt. Yeah. But um, I, she was a very gracious woman, very reserved. And I remember, I, I admire her so much that I tried to get to every event that I knew that Nina was attending. I would try to get there just to be around her. And I'm so happy, I'm privileged that I was able to attend her 75th uh, birthday, and as well as uh, the Taste of Heritage uh, in DC, and as well as Middleton Place. Uh, what I remember about that is even though we were guests coming to partake in this celebration, she actually welcomed my husband and myself into the kitchen to cook alongside her. I had never ever met a chef before, and I was very proud to be there. But what I really want to say about her is something that um, Michael mentioned, and he, you said that there were many uh, Edna Lewises. It's just that we didn't know who they are. My experience is that I've come from two cultures, West Africa, and my grandmother was African American. But my grandmother raised me since I was 10 years old. And when she passed away, I was in college. And I remember my first Thanksgiving without her, I tried to make dinner for my family, and it was a disaster. It wasn't until I bought the taste of country cooking that I actually went back and I made the recipes in that book. And my family said to me, did you find Nana's recipes? Oh. And I says, no, it came from that cookbook, A Taste of Country Cooking. It just brought back to me every single thing my grandmother did came back to me when I made those recipes. So as of this day, I never told Nina, but at every Thanksgiving, I actually follow the recipes that's in that book for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And during the seasonal times also, when I go to the farmer's market, I actually follow the recipes in that book. And all those recipes in that book to this day, I always remember my own grandmother, that recipe for corn pudding, just like my grandmother made it. Mm -hmm. The recipe for cranberry sauce, just like my grandmother made it. 
she, she crab soups, everything that my grandmother used to make, I thought I had lost the recipe, it's mm -hmm. in that book. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful to her for putting together that, as you would call it, a memoir, because it brought back stories about my own grandmother, even though she was born and raised in Texas, it's still a connection there with the food. So I'm very mm -hmm. proud and happy to have met Edna Lewis. Final comment, anybody? Uh, I'd like to ask each of you um, what's next on your agenda. I know that some of you are writing. Um, others of you are television stars. Uh, so, Michael, can you just briefly at least mention the television program? All right. So, um, yeah. So, last year we taped Many Rivers to Cross, a part of the section on um, food. It was like three minutes on TV. It was like eight hours to tape. And the cooking part, I mean, that was all open hearth. You know, old time, that's a seven, that wasn't, we were in a 17th century, 18th century building. And my partner's car broke down the night before. So it was all kind of, you know, ancestors, they, when something's gonna happen, the board director says, this is gonna happen, it happens. No matter what obstacles get put in your way. Um, in um, 2007, I was, I had a little exhibit at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, and they did the anniversary for Virginia. It was a Virginia slave garden. And I remember the feeling I felt when I found out there was no more Edna Lewis. Because remember, that was planned in 2005, 2006. So when we were establishing what would go in the garden, and I was going through all my historical records and calling up my colleagues and friends at Williamsburg and Monticello, the nice folks. and. I said to uh, Dida and Jai, her and her husband Gorgie and Jai knew Edna Lou as well. I said, well, if I do this, you have to make me a promise. I have to have Edna Lewis here. And Diana and Jai looked at me and she said, you know, Miss Edna's not here. And I remember the feeling I had when she told me that. You know, this is before I was on the smart from every five seconds. And everything, you know, you got news. And this was not 24 cable hour news, okay? So it was like that feeling of like back in the past when you think you're writing to your, you know, your parent, your, your grandmother, and she's not there to get like the letter. And I remember I had three days of depression over that because all I really wanted was for her to see that garden and say, see, we have not forgotten. Your children have not forgotten. Our descendants have not forgotten the ones that came before you. And if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know how this garden was supposed to work. So when you said that, Miss Anderson, about grandmother, see, I had two grandmothers, Alabama and Virginia. Then I had South Carolina in the back. My, grand, my, my, my paternal grandfather was still with us, thank God, um, 160 living descendants later. And they cook differently. You know, Virginia folk don't cook like Carolina folk. And I imagine what Tanya was saying, she came up here and there was, you know, I'm sorry, but Carolina folk put a lot of vinegar in their food, and they put pepper indiscriminately. Virginia folk, pepper is danced in the food. Uh, Eastern Carolina, but I'm, I've been down in Winston-Salem. I think mean, Carolina folk be getting all my nerves with that, even though I come from South Carolina. But the point is, is that you, you, when you, not only when you read The Pursuit of Flavor, when you read the cookbook that she did with Scott Pico, we didn't mention that. We, we don't even want to go there, and I don't know. But the point is, the point is, is that there is not one South. There is not one way of African-American cooking. There's not one African diaspora cooking. There is a, there is a certain banjo-influenced, highfalutin, violin, fiddle note that you hear with every single second of those. There's, there's, they'd be read as two works together. Don't read the... Don't read A Taste of Country Cooking if you're not prepared to read A Pursuit of Flavor. The voices may not be the same, but they are complementary texts. They're Old Testament and New Testament. Sorry about that. But, you know, that's what they are. So I think we really, we really need to, uh, to remember that. But I gotta tell you, I felt so depressed because that was my life stream was to see her in that garden with me. Judith. Love me, feed me. <laughs> well, you can get 
guess who's talking. <laughs> uh, I got, uh, three years ago now it is, I got a small dog, thought I could have a nice quiet dog I could put in my pocket, maybe take to Paris or something like that. And I got this little hellion, <laughs> and uh, he clearly loved food, and I hated opening cans and giving that hard kibble that their little pinpoints of teeth can hardly break. So I asked my vet up in Vermont, what would you think if I were to cook for him? And she said, you couldn't do anything better. So that's what I've been doing for three years. And it's different from anything else because, on other books, because they're cooking for your dog. This is sharing. I make things that I know he'll like and I like. And he gets one third and I get two thirds. <laughs> so I've been having fun doing it. I think and that'll be out next, next year? Is that the planned date for publication? Yeah. Okay. Next fall. Tanya, what's up on your agenda? Um, my work is focusing on um, northern influences. Um, I like to, I have a working title that I call um, Beyond the South, Beside um, Slavery and Before Soul Food. Um, as a fourth, fifth generation black person in the north, um, I'm examining some of the influences from centuries old influences of black cookery in places like New York City, Andy, um, New England, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and... Um, in California? No. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Joe, what's next on your agenda? Well, we are... Got to get the mic. Oh, I forgot. We, we are continuing our work at the... Uh, at Chef Joe Randall's Cooking School in Savannah, we are working on uh, two books. Uh, one about the wonderful experience that I've had at the cooking school and the interaction with folks from all over the country who have come to Savannah and given me an opportunity to, to cook for them and, and have fun and entertain them. And so that's a joy in itself. And then we're working on... Uh, uh, I don't know, I want to say memoirs, but when she talked about Edna's memoirs, it didn't sound like mine even are worthy of being put on paper. <laughs> but I've been cooking 50 years. I've uh, been around some wonderful chefs over the years, and I worked on uh, East Coast, West Coast, South, and uh, so we're going to try and document some of that before I stop cooking. Tracy Ann? I, I don't work in food studies. Um, I'm uh, moonlighting right now. So, uh, um, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So, the most southern of, of the things that I'm working on is a study of Creoles in Mobile, Alabama. My research really looks at mixed race women, specifically in various modern fictions. But um, if I could leave you with a pitch, um, with regard to the work that we discussed this evening. It's to not just think that the things that are happening right now, organic, farm to table, um, what is it, uh, uh, head to tail, all of these different, different terms that are out there are new. Um, it's very, very important uh, for us to know our history and to know the histories that um, are often not told in a mainstream kind of way. The way we learn history typically in the United States is through battles and through monuments and things like that. Um, but the, some of the most important people that make the United States what it is are those for whom monuments haven't been erected and history books haven't been written because they don't fit into how history is traditionally understood. So a text like this really um, speaks volumes to that experience and how we have to know more than what is traditionally given to us and that we have to do a little bit of work in order to acquire that knowledge. Okay. Uh, I want to thank our panelists. This was a spectacular panel. And I want to thank those who have come from Denver and from Washington, D.C. 
and from other places just to be here and celebrate to us. I had one other request. Uh, Chef Joe really doesn't want to take back 25 copies of The Taste of um, Country Cooking. And uh, if you just happen to have a little cash in your pocket, buying a book that will go directly to the Edna Lewis Foundation would be greatly appreciated. Thank you all for coming.